Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this month's non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, on Friday the 3rd of September. And um, this, uh, this overview of today's non-farm payrolls report, which it's likely to be an interesting one. I won't lie about that, but I don't think in the wider scheme of things, it will affect um, the Fed's policy when it comes to a tapering of asset purchases. What it might do is it affect the timing. So if we cast our minds back to Jackson Hole a week ago, Jay Powell made a speech which, depending on who you talk to, was either dovish or it was hawkish. You know, and obviously that's that's the big problem, I think, with, with markets at the moment is that depending on your positioning, it can be both. For me, the important thing that Powell stated um, last week was he created a clear delineation between the Fed's inflation mandate and its employment mandate. Um, and that re that reassured markets that while the Fed was likely to taper and the debate was moving in that direction, um, he basically doubled down on the fact that tapering does not mean a very, very quick route to tightening. Um, all that tapering means is that instead of um, expanding the balance sheet by $120 billion a month, they're just doing it at a slower pace. So the balance sheet is still expanding, it's just not expanding as fast. And, you know, it makes sense for the Fed to do this because if you look at when they started out on this tapering process, the unemployment rate was nearly 7% at the end of last year. It's now come down and could come down today to 5.2%. Um, and therefore, the economy has improved sufficiently to warrant a slight reining back of the current accommodative monetary process. Now, Richard, you've raised the point, why is Powell trying to decouple taper from rate rise? Well, because they're two totally different things. Tapering is not tightening, a rate rise is. Um, all that a taper is, is you're slowing down the pace of the balance sheet expansion. So you're still expanding, you're still expansive in terms of your monetary policy. And what does adding $120 billion a month to the balance sheet get you that $60 billion a month doesn't get you? given the fact that the problems that the US economy is suffering from at the moment are not demand driven, they're supply driven. You've got, you've got contractions in supply chains, you've got factories shutting down because they can't get semiconductor components to produce new motor vehicles, um, and you're getting inflation um, pressures as a consequence of blockages in supply chains. It's not for want of a lack of demand that you're having a problem with the economy and a slowdown in, in economic growth. It's because of problems within supply chains. It's problems with respect to um, stimulus starting to roll off. And you've got a workforce that at the moment in the US is still in receipt in a lot of states of stimulus checks. So they have no incentive to return to the workforce. Now, there is, you know, as a consequence of that, you've seen yields fall back. We can certainly see that in the context of the, the US 10 year yield. If we look at this 10 year yield chart here that I've got in front of, front of me right now, US 10 year yields have been in decline pretty much since March. Now, we started to, to rebound back, which suggests that we could start to see upward pressure on yields. And if we do start to see upward pressure on yields, then you could st start to see the dollar rebound. But there's a fairly decent cap in and around 137, 138. And you've also got a downtrend line coming in here. So while we've seen a short term base in yields around about 112, 113, we've also got a short term cap around about 138. And at the moment, we're trading that range. So at the moment, the market is undecided in terms of when a taper is likely to occur. Will it, will it be announced in the September meeting, um, which is on the 22nd of September, for to start in October? Or will a weak payrolls number push it back 
towards December and potentially the beginning of next year. And that essentially is what the debate is about at the moment. It's not about will the Fed taper, you know, that's that's priced in. It's really a question of when will they start and then how quickly will they end? Now, there are a number of policymakers on the FOMC committee who want it to, to the taper to finish by the middle of next year. Well, that still gives us another nine months of tapering, um, but another nine months of an expanding balance sheet, albeit at a slightly lower rate. So for me, today's payrolls report is not so much about whether or not it will stop the taper or make a taper more likely. It's about when that taper starts. So if we get a weak payrolls number, and there's no, there's no reason to suggest that we might. Yes, we look at the ADP payrolls report earlier this week, which was disappointing. Um, we look at the ISM manufacturing and the employment component in that, which slipped back into contraction territory, and all the point, all, all the all the evidence points to um, a potentially weaker payrolls report. But we've come off the back of two nine hundred thousand plus payrolls report. So even if we get a number in in, a re, in the region of between six hundred and fifty and eight hundred and fifty thousand, it's not the end of the world. The midpoint of that is seven twenty five. The lower estimates for non-farm payrolls today are 400k. The upper estimates are around about 1 million. And there's some way you would like to think. Things that point to a weaker payrolls report, or obviously I've mentioned the weaker ADP numbers, the, the drop in consumer confidence that we saw in Tuesday as a result of rising Delta variant cases in August. Um, obviously, weak car sales as well. Um, people being signed off sick as a result of getting uh, COVID um, as well. So there is a concern that um, people won't have been rushing back to the workforce in August because of the fact that because of school holidays as well. All of these employment benefits now expire in September. So some states have already rolled them back. So you could see a jump in the states which rolled back their unemployment benefits, forcing people back into the workforce. But on the flip side of that, you could also see um, in the states where they haven't done that, people will have been reticent to return to the workforce for fear of A, getting COVID, or B, because they haven't got anywhere to look after their kids before they go back to school. So there's an awful lot of toing and froing ebb and flow in terms of the payrolls numbers. If we look at the weekly jobless claims numbers, they've been continuing to come down pre-pandemic low earlier this week. I mean, this week's numbers don't aren't included in this, this month's, pay, in the August payrolls report, so they don't matter that much, but they still point to the fact that we could get a September report that is equally as strong. So for me, it's really about, will the unemployment rate come down to from 54 to 5.2%? How much of a slowdown have we seen in the payrolls report for August? Does it matter, given the fact that ADP was weak in July and we still got a bumper July non-farms report? More importantly, what will it do to the timeline for a Fed tapering of asset purchases? And for me, I think I'm still looking somewhere in the November of December of the likely start of the tapering of asset purchase program. So what does that mean for currencies more broadly? Well, we've talked about this dollar mix. I think don't, I don't think we really need to say too much more about that. But what I would say about this, the dollar in general, is the dollars come off this week largely predicated on the fact that we, we, we could well get a weak number. So a weak number, I think, by and large, is priced in to a certain extent. So I think for me, um, if the dollar continues to weaken, obviously that will push it push stuff like the euro, gold um, higher um, because it will essentially drive yields lower and that will in turn um, diminish the attractiveness, the attractiveness of the US dollar. And even though euro inflation came in at 3% this week in its latest numbers, I don't think anyone for one minute would expect the ECB next week to signal that they're likely to tighten monetary policy anytime soon. So 
I think, if anything, a weak number today merely defers a dollar rebound. It certainly doesn't postpone it. We can certainly see that played out in euro dollar. We've seen a fairly decent level of weakness over the course of the past few days on the basis of a weak number. So you could argue that now we're back around 119.10, 119.70. There's a big, big barrier to further dollar weakness with respect to euro dollar. And I think that for me, I think that for me is the key component here. I think a weak number needn't be particularly dollar negative. It will certainly try and push it lower initially, but I struggle to see where the additional downside is going to come from, uh, unless it's a really horrible number. And by horrible, I mean at the lower end of expectations, which could potentially push a taper out um, towards um, potentially the beginning of next year. That is not my baseline. Um, it would certainly, a poor number would certainly push um, the US 10 year back below 1.3% where it is now. Um, and it would certainly push gold up towards weight, towards 1835. And we can talk about that because if we look at the way euro is trading and we look at the way gold is trading, it's not totally dissimilar in terms of the way the price action has been moving. If we look at this chart here, you've got a series of peaks all the way through here in gold. Um, so it doesn't look dissimilar to euro dollar um, in terms of the rebound that we saw from the flash crash lows just over a month ago. Um, and we've got a very decent significant barrier in and around this 1834-1835 area. So gold and euro are acting as a little bit of a proxy for dollar weakness at the moment. So it'll be very, very interesting to see whether or not that continues um, in the wake of today's payrolls and numbers. Um, Certainly, I'm just going to have a quick look at any other questions that I might have missed and try and address them before the actual numbers themselves. So, um, to, with respect to the question about, um, you're right, the sterling Aussie and Euro Aussie, just Stephen, remind me of that if I don't cover it before the numbers. Um, so, the, the question about trying to decouple taper from rate rise, I think I've explained that. Essentially, um, they're completely different things. Um, a rate rise is a de facto tightening of policy, or is a slowing down of balance sheet expansion isn't really. Um, so it's really about managing expectations. If you say something often enough and long enough, markets will slowly get used to the idea. And when it when you actually do it, there shouldn't be that much of a market reaction. I call it I call it hand holding, if you like. The market is like an errant toddler. Sometimes it needs its hand holding to keep it calm while you're trying to get it to do something that it doesn't really want to do. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's that's essentially what central bankers are having to try and do at the moment, trying to navigate the way around the toddler that every time you slightly change the, uh, the game for it, throws a bit of a tantrum. Um, you know, and it's going to be very, very difficult, I think, over the course of the next four or five years for central banks to pull back from the current easy monetary policy that they um, have currently thrown at the markets in the wake of this pandemic. But nonetheless, I think they are going to have to start down that road. Whether they succeed in going down that road is a completely different question entirely. The ECB certainly won't be in a position too tight any time soon. And that's before we even talk about the thorny aspect of the Europe, uh, the German elections, which comes at the end of this month, and where Angela Merkel is stepping down. And there is no really obvious successor to her. So um, as I say, weaker dollar, keep an eye on those resistance levels on euro dollar at 119.10 and gold around about 118.35. If we get a break above there, then we could see further dollar weakness. Obviously, a poor number on dollar yen will push us back down towards 109.10. But when I look at that chart, you know, the price action is pitiful, really. It's very, very difficult to say with any degree of certainty which way it's going to go. But if I was going to err one way or the other, I'd suggest that we might see a drift back lower, but at the moment 110.20, 109.20 pretty much covers it. And the problem with dollar yen at the moment is you've got the fact that 
um, Japanese Prime Minister has just stepped down. And as a consequence of that, you could see a little bit of yen weakness if the market thinks that any any of his um, successors could start on a significant stimulus program. If we look at cable, for example, you know, I, st I still think that we can see a little bit um, of dollar strength in the wake of these numbers, simply on the basis of the fact that um, we are probably near near the near the highs of the week when it comes to the US sorry the lows of the week when it comes to the US dollar highs of the week for cable highs of the week for euro so I think the risk trade at the moment is probably less to the upside and more to the downside uh, in terms of sterling in terms of euro um, which means that the dollar could actually start to the, the pound could start to drift lower and the dollar start to push back higher and we've also got the small matter of the US Labor Day holiday. You know, if we look at the if we look at the dollar index, I'm just going to try and pull that up for you. Just keeping one eye on the time because I am aware that we are starting to run out of it as we come to the numbers. Now I'm just pull up the chart, bring it over here. Look at the dollar index. I mean, we've seen some pretty hefty falls. And um, on that basis, I would be surprised if we see significant amounts of further weakness this week. But, you know, I've been wrong before. I mean, if you, you know, if you had to push me in one direction or the other, I think there's potential for a little bit of a short squeeze on the dollar as we look ahead to the numbers in three minutes time. So what are we expecting? Well, 725,000 on the headline number. We're expecting the unemployment rate to fall back from 5.2 to 5.4 percent and we're looking for the participation rate and this is the key thing here we've got a whole host of job vacancies not even 9 million job vacancies at the moment in the u.s economy and no sign at the moment that um, there is any evidence that uh, they are looking to get filled nonetheless there is certainly more jobs in the market um, looking to be filled um, than there are people who've fallen out of the labour force since February 2020, when the participation rate was 63.4%. So I would be surprised if we don't see the labour participation rate nudge up from its current 61.7%. Now, expectations are for a move higher to 61.8. If we get a move higher in the participation rate and a fall in the unemployment rate, that's unequivocally positive um, because it suggests people are returning to the workforce and um, getting into jobs. Um, in terms of the headline number, I've already talked about that, 725. Watch for a revision to the July number. That was 943. And average hourly earnings, they're expected to moderate slightly from 4%, current 4% to 3.9. So, in essence, I think anything above 800,000, I'm calling for about 800,000 on the payrolls numbers, anything above 800,000 is likely to be dollar positive. Even if we come in as expected, I would expect to see a little bit of a rebound in the dollar, but it really does depend on the overall numbers. In terms of US markets and key resistance and support levels, quickly do the S&P 500. We can see this line here basically tells its own story looking to buy dips. Um, those of you who basically um, sat through my last payrolls number will have known that, you know, if, if I've drawn this line in before, the 50-day moving average continues to hold hold the upside on that. The NASDAQ less, less so, but it's still fairly positive. And we are now 30 seconds away from the headline number. So I am just about to get ready, send a notification on the headline numbers um, in anticipation that um, we should get a fairly decent number in around about 10 seconds time. FTSE 100 is at the top end of its recent range. So 7190 is the key resistance level there for those of you who want to know it. So here we go. Oh, goodness gracious me, 235, that's a dreadful number. Right, okay, so that's below, um, that is certainly below most people's 
expectations. So let's try and disseminate these numbers because that is not great. Average earnings, let's get rid of that, 235. They've revised the previous number up to over a million. And the unemployment rate has fallen to 5.2%. And the participation rate, 61.7%. So it's hard to really drive anything from that, but certainly it's dollar negative. I had to double take that. Let's go and pull this out. So let's see how the euro dollar behaves around about 119.10, 119.20. I was expecting a slightly softer report. I certainly wasn't expecting that. So let's look at this chart here. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not um, we get a break above this series of peaks through here. No question it's a disappointing report. Certainly markets are not reacting particularly positively to it, um, simply because I think they're trying to make sense of it. So um, going back to the actual numbers themselves, I think the key thing for me is what does this mean for a tapering of asset purchases? It certainly makes the Fed's job much more complicated. I'm going to have to disseminate the numbers more broadly, but what I would say is that while the numbers are disappointing, it probably means that a, a, an October or November taper is off the table at this point in time. It means the October payrolls report is likely to be much more important in the overall scheme of things. And means that a taper is probably likely to happen much more closer towards the end of the year than in October or November. So for me, what this means is this taper delayed more than taper deferred, even though they're probably the same thing. Um, so bit of dollar weakness, probably see a retest of retest of these peaks here, 119.10 on euro dollar, see a retest of 118.35.40 on the gold price. As I suspected, we probably would, and dollar yen will probably drift back down to around about 109.20 um, over the course of the rest of the day. Right. Um, any questions? Is there? Does anyone want to basically ask me anything more about this this particular payrolls report? Yes, it's disappointing, um, but in the scheme of things, does it really change anything? I don't think it does um, in terms of of a taper. It's obviously very disappointing but it's also not particularly surprising um, in terms of what the US economy has gone through in August. I think Q3 is likely to be slightly disappointing in terms of the growth numbers. This payrolls numbers would appear to suggest that. Um, and as a consequence of that, you could probably see a little bit of dollar weakness heading into the end of the day, but I don't think it undermines the overall um, feeling that I have is that this dollar weakness is temporary and that um, we should still look to buy the dollar on dips because I still I still feel that um, in the absence obviously of any further delta disruption obviously there's been the storms on the on the east coast this week which probably will have caused a little bit of disruption as well um, you should see a bit of a bounce back in September for um, you know, as, as the schools go back after the Labor Day holiday, which is Monday. Um, so we're, we're having another look at 18.35, but we're really struggling to move above it. Now we're falling back quite sharply on the gold price. I would expect something similar to happen on Euro dollar. We could see a little bit of a drift um, back down on the cable as well, though probably not as much. Right. Can I look at the Hong Kong 50? Yep, I'll look at it in a, in a second. Okay. Sterling, someone asked me Sterling Aussie and Euro Aussie. Yep, so I'll have a look at that. Has anyone got any other questions about dollar before, um, before I move on? To sterling Aussie and Euro Aussie, and then Hong Kong 50.
have we discussed sterling dollar um we have but i can go over it again just write that down hong kong 50 okay right first come first serve so sterling aussie for Stephen. we're suffering a little bit on the back of the of the rebound in the aussie dollar i certainly think there's potential for a little bit more weakness in sterling aussie and if i put in some fib levels knock out the 23.6 because i don't need that and also draw in some trend lines okay so in terms of sterling aussie we've got a peak in and around these june years of around about 185.24 so i certainly think there's potential for further weakness back to this fibonacci retracement here where we could see a little bit of a rebound but overall i think there is potential for a little bit more weakness in the short to medium term before we rebound i don't think we're quite there yet obviously on the daily chart there was this nice bearish daily reversal there which prompted a sharp move lower we've continued to see that i think it'll probably be important if we're looking at sterling aussie to also look at dollar aussie as well because that can sometimes give you important clues as to about overall aussie strength more broadly thank you for that close that notification i don't want that um aussie dollar so here's some analysis i did earlier on aussie dollar um so I've taken the february highs to the lows that we saw um back in august we've come back and we're currently testing this resistance level here, which is a 38.2 retracement of this entire move here. So that would suggest here that there is a little bit of resistance selling pressure in and around 74.60, 74.70, which we would need to overcome to push higher in terms of Aussie strength. And I would suggest that maybe, given the fact that it's Friday, we could find it difficult to crack this particular level in the short to medium term on the aussie dollar so aussie strength may be starting to taper off a little bit on the mainstream aussie chart there's also euro aussie wasn't there Stephen? so i'm going to cover that okay let's just draw a nice little trend line in on this those of you who notice that i do like trend lines and i do like to draw quite a lot of it not too many not too many but just to give an indication of price direction and price strength and again here we've got a decent area of support in euro aussie around about the 11th of august lows of 159 so euro aussie is finding a little bit of support around about 159 um, which coincides with that low there and that low there so if you are short of euro aussie it might be worth uh, maybe taking a little bit of profit ahead of that line there because you've then got the 200 day moving average and this trend line support coming in slightly lower down it's never a bad idea to take a profit um okay hong kong 50. with everything that's going on in china and what have you that looks to me as it could be on the cusp of finding a little bit of a base it's had two goes at 24,700 there or thereabouts but for me i think if we're to make further progress on euro aussie sorry euro aussie hong kong 50 what am i talking about hong kong 50 we really need to to break through that area there because it was support on the way down we broke below it we tested back above it we couldn't get back above it we need to get back above 26,770 um, to signal that a base is in on the Hong Kong 50 and push up a little higher right sterling dollar I'm just being asked about natural gas I'll just quickly jot that down 
so that I don't forget and I'll tick them off as I go. That's a Hong Kong 50. Uh, sterling dollar, it's in an uptrend. This is a four hour chart that I'm pointing at here. Um, as we can see, we've seen an initial bit of dollar weakness, but now we're starting to come back. Um, I think there is potential for us to come back to the to this trend line here, so 137.80 um, in the short to medium term. We are finding a little bit of resistance anywhere through 138.70 and 139. That's not to say that we won't break that, but I don't think the momentum is there quite yet to push higher. So for me, I think sterling is very much buy on dips, which means that I'd be probably looking to try and get back in on a pullback down towards this line here and the 50 day moving average. Now, every day on cable on the Spreadbet platform, I post forum updates on the cable, which can be found on the forum there on the left hand side. And I also outline my analysis um, on that particular asset class or currency pair or product or what have you. So I'm still fairly bullish on cable. Um, but I think we could see a little bit of weakness first before we try and retest that 139 area over the course of the next few days. Now, natural gas. Let's have a look at natural gas. Yeah, that's looking a little bit tasty, isn't it? I mean, what I would say about that is that it's well out over its skis as far as the 200 day moving average is concerned. And that at some point, it's going to need to come back to its long term average. The big problem with that is timing it is problematic in the extreme. One thing I would say on this daily chart is though that um, this candle here would suggest that there is some natural selling interest here. Um, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to extrapolate where we're likely to go to next. I might have to go out slightly further to try and get an idea of where the previous highs are. And you've got a series of highs through here, November 2018, which it's likely to be a big barrier. So the highest close 2018 was 403, 4463.50. So I think if we close, well, if you know, if we close anywhere near here, I'd be a little bit concerned because this weekly candle is suggesting to me that we could well see a retest of these peaks here. You know, and this is the big worry. If we take out these peaks all the way back here, we could well see further gains. And if you go all the way back, you know, it's it's not a pretty picture. Um, so we're approaching a very key resistance level on natural gas at the moment, um, which if it holds, should be enough to keep you in. But I certainly wouldn't be betting my mortgage on it, which is probably not what you want to hear, I'm afraid. But, um, you, know, you know, that's about the only encouragement I can give you that we're approaching a very key resistance level um, from 2018. Any other questions, uh, ladies and gents? Before I wind this up quickly, have a, have a quick look at Brent. Brent crudes um, approaching a very key resistance level, pushing right up against it. Um, OPEC plus just announced another 400,000 barrels being added to um, being added to the the, the daily daily supply um, with another 400,000 barrels a day set to be added in October. So this is a quite a key this is, this is quite a key trend line here on on Brent, um, which if it breaks could well see a retest of 76. The previous peaks there. Go back to gold. Where are we now? Back down again. So this resistance level has still held. And let's have a look at the S&P. So all those gains that we saw in the in the in the pre-market are starting to come back a little bit as we head into the long Labor Day weekend. If we look at a weekly chart on this. We can still see we've seen some fairly decent gains on the S and P. So um, I would suggest that we may well have seen the highs for this week on the basis of that payrolls report. Certainly, the 
the spike higher that we saw in the aftermath of the numbers doesn't really appear to be holding. But it's early days. Okay, so it's um, 145. Does anyone else have any other questions? Otherwise, I will wind this up. Um, I've also posted a um, my weekly video, which will go live at 4 p.m. today on the news and analysis section of the website, um, where I cover the ECB meeting next week. Um, talk a little bit about the German elections that are coming up and um, just generally look ahead to the next few days. As for next month's payrolls report, um, at the moment, there's a possibility that might not happen because I'm supposed to be on annual leave. It's my wife's birthday. I'm taking her away for a, uh, for a week. Um, but there is, a, there is also a chance that I might actually get back in time to do it. So I'll know more that two weeks before the payrolls number. Um, but at the moment, it's 50-50 as to whether or not um, I can get someone else to do um, the payrolls number in my absence. But um, I'll work on trying trying to get the, I'll try, work on trying to trying to get someone else to do it in the meantime. Otherwise, thanks all very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to wish you all a great weekend, and um, uh, thanks very much for listening today. And until the same time same place, hopefully next month.